Good evening, friends near and far. My name is Uriel Perez, and I'm a part of the events team here at Book People located uh, right here in Austin, Texas. I am so, so very honored to welcome you on behalf of the store for this very special virtual event in celebration of Michelle's honors, Crying in H Mart. And we're so thrilled to have Lucy Dacus in to moderate, uh, Lucy Dacus in to moderate, apologies. If you haven't yet ordered a copy of Crying in H Mart, I implore you to please, please consider purchasing a copy of the book from Book People. It's a gorgeous book about grief and family and food, and I'm just loving every page of it. We can ship almost anywhere, or you can pick up books up uh, in the store or through our curbside pickup service. We'll be dropping links in the chat throughout the program to help out with that. I know it's a very lively chat here, so uh, we'll we'll kind of keep doing it throughout the program. And um, just a reminder that your book purchase uh, directly supports our bookstore, our booksellers, and it helps us put on first-rate productions like this. So it's the win-win. Now. To give everyone a quick walk through our platform and our event, after this introduction, our guests will be joining us up on the screen. They'll talk a bit about the book. I hear there's gonna be a really awesome reading uh, just after this. And then we're gonna be opening up for a Q&A towards the end. So be thinking about those questions you have uh, for Michelle and for Lucy, and uh, just make sure you include them in the Q&A. So that's uh, just below this video screen. There's a bar with a bunch of little widgets. Make sure to put it in that Q&A uh, that way we can all see them. Um, so yeah, before we get started, I did want to remind our viewers that by registering for this event, you are agreeing to refrain from engaging in inappropriate behavior and harassment of any kind throughout the course of this event. That includes racial slurs, profanity, hate speech, spam comments, et cetera. Just behave guys, be cool. Um, and just please note that uh, any participants who do engage in inappropriate behavior, harassment of any kind will be immediately ejected from this and all future events. Now, let's get on to the fun part. Let's do some bios here. So Michelle Zahner is best known as a singer and guitarist who creates dreamy shoegaze inspired indie pop under the name Japanese Breakfast. She has won acclaim from major music outlets around the world for releases like Psychopomp and Soft Sounds from Another Planet. I was listening to the song Till Death all day today. I love it. And about our special guest moderator, Lucy Dacus. She's a singer, songwriter, musician, and performer. She has released two full-length albums under her name, 2016's No Burden and 2018's Historian. And the Boy Genius album in 2018 with her bandmates Phoebe Bridgers and Julian Baker. The third Lucy Dacus album, Home Video, so excited about that one, will be released in the summer of 2021. And now I'd like to welcome Michelle up on the stage, who's going to be doing a real awesome reading for us. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm so excited. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited to be here day four on the book tour. Thank you guys for, for coming. Um, I thought since Lucy was so generous with her time and we're both uh, two musicians that I would read a passage from my book about my love of music as a teenager and, and the sort of rift it, it started in uh, my mom and I's relationship as a teen. Um, this particular passage is, is when I sort of fall in love with, with the indie rock. Into the vacuum of my disinterest, music rushed to fill the void. It cracked a fissure, splintered a vein through the already precarious and widening rift between my mother and me. It would become a chasm that threatened to swallow us whole. Nothing was as vital as music, the only comfort for my existential dread. I spent my days downloading songs one at a time off LimeWire and getting into heated discussions on AIM about whether the Foo Fighters' acoustic version of Everlong was better than the original. I pocketed my allowance and lunch money to spend exclusively on CDs from House of Records, analyzing lyrics in the liner notes, obsessing over interviews with the champions of Pacific Northwest Indie Rock, memorizing the rosters of labels like K Records and Kill Rock Stars, and plotting which concerts I'd attend. But nothing impacted me so profoundly as the first time I got my hands on a DVD of the Yeah Yeah Yeahs live at the Fillmore. The front woman, Kara No, was the first icon of the music world I worshipped who looked like me. She was half Korean and half white, with an unrivaled showmanship that obliterated the docile Asian stereotype. She was famous for wild onstage antics, spitting water into the air, bounding across the far edges of the stage, and deep-throating a microphone before lassoing it above her head by its cable. Agape at the image, I found myself in a strange state of ambivalence. My first thought being, how do I get to do that? And my second, if there's already one Asian girl doing this, then there's no longer space for me. 
Back then, I didn't know what a scarcity mentality was. The dialogue surrounding representation in music was in its nascent stages. And because I didn't personally know any other girls who played music, I didn't know there were others like me struggling with the same feelings. I didn't have this analogical capacity to imagine a white boy in the same situation, watching a live DVD of, say, The Stooges, and thinking, if there's already an Iggy Pop, how could there possibly be room for another white guy in music? Nevertheless, Karen O made music feel more accessible, made me believe it was possible that someone like me could one day make something that meant something to other people. Fueled by this newfound optimism, I began to badger my mother incessantly for a guitar. Having already sunk a hefty sum on a long list of extracurriculars I'd summarily abandoned, she was reluctant to oblige. But by Christmas, she finally broke down. And at last, I received a $100 Yamaha acoustic in a box from Costco. The action was so high, it felt, le it felt like you had to wrestle the strings half an inch to pin them to the fret. I started taking lessons once a week at the most embarrassing place one can learn how to play the guitar, the Lesson Factory. The Lesson Factory was like the Walmart of guitar lessons. It was connected to the Guitar Center and inside there were about 10 soundproof cubicles, each equipped with two chairs and two amplifiers and your very own defeated musician recruited off of Craigslist. I was lucky enough to be paired with a teacher I actually liked, who must have considered me a welcome break from prepubescent boys who exclusively wanted to learn how to play Green Day songs in the intro to Stairway to Heaven. The lessons couldn't have come at a better time. The same year, Nick Holly Gamer took the seat next to me in English, and it felt like I'd won the lottery. I'd heard about him because he was Maya Brown's neighbor and ex-boyfriend. I didn't have any classes with Maya, but she was known to all of us because every boy in our grade had a crush on her. Infuriatingly, she was objectively pretty and popular, but masqueraded as a tormented alternative. She dyed her brown hair jet black, wore caramel-colored corduroys, and would write things on her arms and pens she would, so she wouldn't forget them. Thoughts she later wrote in her live journal, which I followed assiduously, even though we weren't friends in real life. Her entries were made up of bright eyes lyrics, conflated with her own romantic encounters and meandering ruminations, largely written in the second person, directed at someone anonymous who had either wronged her or for whom she desperately longed. I thought she was one of the great American poets of our time. Nick had shaggy blonde hair, painted his nails with white out, and wore a silver hoop earring in one ear. In class, he was quiet and terribly slow, like he was stoned all the time. He was constantly asking me when assignments were due and if he could borrow my notes, hapless requests that I deftly roped into my private mission to befriend him. In middle school, Nick had a band called the Barrowitz. I didn't know anyone who played in a band, and it felt impossibly cool that Nick already had one. They put out one EP before disbanding, which I diligently hunted down from a friend of a friend. It was a burned disc folded inside a homemade paper envelope the drawings and titles written in Sharpie. As soon as I got home, I slipped the disc into the boom box I kept on my desk. I sat on a rolling chair and listened, still holding the paper envelope in my clammy hands as I poured over the lyrics, imagining Nick Holly Gamer's wildly sexually experienced past. There were five tracks, the last a song called Molly's Lips. I wondered if Molly was another one of his many exes, or if it was perhaps a pseudonym for Maya Brown. I was too stupid to know that Molly's Lips was actually just a Nirvana cover, and I would like to think that Nick was at least too stupid to know that Nirvana was covering the Vaselines. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my I gosh. Love you. Hi. Uh, I freaking love your Thank you so much for. Book. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, I was like so overjoyed to get it in the mail. Thank you for sending it to me. I love that you just read that part because. There's so many little details <laughs> that I was just like, ah. I mean, like Karen O in general, I'm also a huge fan of Karen O. I just loved how you talked about her. And it's funny because, do you know the song Poor Song? That's like yeah. the hidden track. Well, it's not hidden on Spotify, but if you had the CD of Fever to Tell, it was like Back the in hidden our track. generation. <laughs> Back in our, um, <laughs> but it was like hidden after Modern Romance. And yeah. yeah. I felt like the way that you wrote about your wedding and just kind of like we're gonna do this type of thing <laughs> like it like it, there was you know obviously you were trying to make it so that your mother could attend but there's also this kind of like casual like that's just how it is we love each other kind of vibe um do you am I off base with that like do you do you resonate with that song 
I have, I like, it's been a minute since I've listened to Poor Song, but um, yeah, I mean, that was definitely the vibe of our wedding. Um, you know, I, I would, like I say in the book, I feel like, um, you know, I, I'm like of a generation where I feel like, you know, marriage has never been something I thought much about or placed like too much importance into. And yeah, I just got really lucky that it's worked out really well so far, <laughs> you know, like, uh, and, and one thing I said to my husband was just like, you know, if it doesn't work out, we'll just be like hot, you know, young divorcees. And like, that's like some like sexy mystery to it that yeah. I, I don't, I don't really mind. <laughs> that's classy in and of itself. <laughs> um by the way I want to tell everybody that we had like a little like tech five minutes before y'all got on and I was in my sweatshirt and I saw that Michelle looked like cool as shit and I was like oh yeah I gotta but find I, something I will say like on. I'm in I'm in sweatpants like under like <laughs> here down <laughs> I'll just that's the way <laughs> that's the, the way. way yeah I also I'm curious when did you t- when did you take um guitar lessons and did you have like a goofy place and a first shitty kind of Yamaha guitar memory yeah I never took lessons and I'm still bad at guitar but I had a three-quarter Ibanez from Craigslist it was like a (laughs) hundred dollars and it's the first time that I ever used Craigslist and the idea of like meeting up with a stranger in a parking lot I felt like we were doing like a drug deal yeah Um, yeah yeah. but yeah I named it Todd the guitar (laughs) did you ever name guitars uh I'm sure that I did I can't remember um the name of mine a terrible Yamaha acoustic guitar but mm-hmm. uh I remember I remember doing like this really terrible like kind of like cutesy anti-folk uh solo thing for a short period of time where I like I might have drawn like eyes on my guitar at point. yeah like <laughs> crying yeah. eyes <laughs> yeah basically it was it was like cartoon eyes and it was a uh, it's pretty mortifying in but can you imagine if that oh. craigslist guy found out that like you're lucy dacus now and that he sold you <laughs> your first guitar he <laughs> it was in mechanicsville virginia so i'm sure that he wouldn't be impressed <laughs> actually I, really um, would. I feel like those people would be very impressed we had two tickets to webster hall <laughs> um I also, before we get off of the passage that you read, um, you mentioned your friend putting Bright Eyes lyrics in her journal. Um, and we're supposed to play a show I together know. with yeah. Bright Eyes. Do you, were you a fan of happening? Bright Eyes? Do you know? <laughs> I don't, I don't actually know. I don't know how much we should even talk about that. I don't think it's for sure. Um, but yeah. uh, what, I've been what, looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was a wild, um, that was a wild show that's playing. Yeah. That is hopefully still what? happening, but I don't know if it is. <laughs> yeah, who knows? But do you have any other like full circle moments in music or now with this book where like somebody you'd been a fan of for a super long time started to recognize you? I would yeah. especially love to hear if there's any authors that have reached out to you like praising you that have it's meant a lot. Um, yeah, I'm, it's easier with music. Um, one thing that's like really incredible is that, you know, Ben Gibbard is doing one of these events with me and, you know, Death Cab for Cutie was such an enormous influence on, on my music and, uh, songwriting. And I just, I love his writing so much. And he's still just, my husband and I both just like, will belt a, a Death Cab song in the in the car and uh yeah so I'm so excited um we saw him in Chicago like right pre-pandemic and uh they like dedicated calf to Jaffe's breakfast for some reason and uh yeah it was just like an incredible moment um Wayne Coyne from Flaming Lifts also very cool like has slid into the has slid into the DMs uh not in a weird way but like, <laughs> like in a mm-hmm. different way. yeah Probably yeah yeah like, I did do um, Mark Hoffice's podcast and um, that was really sick because he actually seemed to have really read the book. Like um, uh, he like called me out on a passage where I talk about like my husband singing um, well, well other hipsters were singing Blink-182 and Mm -hmm. these are anthems. And he was like, what, what what are you trying to say with that passage? And I was like, oh my God. Uh, That was pretty wild i'm trying to think i mean i feel like i'm so 
new to the literary world. Um, I feel like I've befriended like a number, a lot of like Asian American writers. Like um, I, I really love Al- Alexander Chi's book, um, how to how to write an autobiographical novel. Yeah, and, I've been meaning to read that for express, a long time. Music express and then uh, Gia Tolentino is doing another book event, and I, I like everyone else in the entire world, was obsessed with um, Trick Mirror, and so yeah. I'm, you know, just knowing that she has read my book and that brilliant uh, mind is is going to talk to me about it is is pretty pretty exciting. That's so cool. Yeah, I love her. I'm looking at my phone because I have questions <laughs> for you, and I don't know uh, what order I should go in, but. Um, I think the, I know that you've been writing this for a really long time. I mean, you started it when, in like 2017 or? Um, I feel like it was pretty casual from like 2016 to 2017 and then more serious from 2018 to 2020. Yeah. How did you know it was done? Because I can understand the kind of like slow, like, oh, it's becoming a book type of feeling, but finishing it seems even harder than beginning uh it totally is um I remember when I turned in the final draft of this book I was just absolutely devastated (laughs) I thought I had let myself down and I thought I had let my mother's memory down I thought I had had let the publisher down and my editor down and I just was like, I had just completely lost perspective and I just like, I could not spend any more time with it. And I had to like, take this cold hard look at myself and just say, you know what, like, I just don't have any more perspective to give. And um, this is just who I am as a writer right now. And there's this, I don't know if you have this as a musician or as a writer, but like, I, I've never felt more than like this past couple of years working on projects that I was like hitting the ceiling of like my brain you know (laughs) like I felt Mm -hmm. like like I could see myself as like this like with a superior intellect and I kept wanting to like break over there and I was just like constantly colliding with like my own lack and stupidity and I felt very much that way when I wrote this book but then I had to kind of just take a moment and say you know like this is an archive of like who you are right now and like oh let's read uh, and um, what your skill set is at the moment, and like you have nothing more to give <laughs> in yeah. this t- at this time. Um, I feel that way about records too, where it's just sort of like the more you keep trying to add, starts get like making it worse, and and you kind of just have to like say, okay, like I've tr- I've tr- I've, ex- I've explored all the avenues, and like at this point, I keep adding stuff that is is making it worse. Um, and yeah. I just need to like walk away at this point in time. I do think that like in terms of, of um, artists that I know, I think that is something that I'm pretty good at is, is letting go. Uh, I know a lot of people who are certainly much more talented than I am and, and mm-hmm. I think have, have, a, have a more difficult time with that. I feel like it's humbling though, what you just described about like hitting your ceiling and then seeing <laughs> who you, what you wish you could do. I think we talked Absolutely, about that one time. Yeah. And you actually gave me some advice that like really helped me where you were like, read books by people Uh, that aren't that good. (laughs) (laughs) Like just read, read something, not, not to make you like call out and drag any books for not being that good. Unless you want to. But um, I, I I definitely want to, but will not. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yeah. I thought that was awesome. Just like, you know, when, if you're like a reader and you're reading like the most magnificent voices in literature, it can feel really defeating to try and begin writing. Do you have any pointers for anybody who wants to believe that they can write a book, but isn't quite like there? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, so much of writing this book was just like putting in the work every day and like creating these little assignments for myself that I I had to like complete um I think like just learning how to like forgive really bad writing for a long time and just trust that so much of the book comes together in the revision process uh is is a big key to it for me you know I was on tour for a lot of this book and you know I would write I my goal was to try to write a thousand words every day um until I reach 90,000 words and then spend all this time revising and just like cutting the fat ruthlessly um, and so I, uh, you know, wrote 
like between soundtracks and in vans and on planes and in hotels, like, you know, just like a lot of g- complete garbage. And sometimes like there would be one sentence or like one idea that that was like really great and something to jump off of the next time. And and I think that that's like the best thing. And I I do that with music too. And I think that in a big way, that's how Japanese Breakfast even started was I, I started Japanese Breakfast with a song a day project because I was feeling really stuck. And so I wrote and recorded songs every day for the month of June. And what was really extraordinary about that experience, even though a lot of it is like lo-fi garbage, um, was that it created the raw source material for so many of my songs. And, uh, you know, was just getting that first process out of the way and then going back in with the second second stage is, uh, I feel like, really, really, really helpful for me and, and something I would definitely recommend uh, to other people. Yeah, just like collecting material. That's real cool. Are totally, there any, yeah. like, parts of the book that you had to cut that stick oh, with yeah. you and like yeah. you wish are, are there any that you would talk about yeah there's so much because I also feel like my editing style maybe just because I'm like a really impatient person is like if it's not working I, it's just not working mm-hmm. and like be have it be gone then then try to work it in I had um there's a couple the second chapter was like a real bitch uh for me like I I rewrote that second chapter so many times Uh, There was like a lot, there was a long passage about like um, my failed extracurriculars as a child uh, that my mom uh, made me do. And then I had a a brief chapter where I I talked, for some reason, I went on this long tangent about how in love with chess I was uh, when I was a, a young kid. Um, that in retrospect had nothing to do with the book at all. So Mm -hmm. not cut. Um, there was a long passage about my Korean first birthday that was cut. One thing that I do miss that I feel like I could have worked in, but I just like, you know, so many people were like, just get rid of this. Uh, was like, my mom had like one best friend, um, in Eugene, whose name was Youngsoon. And she was a Korean adoptee that was like, kind of the two of them were a really odd match because my mom was like an incredibly put together woman and she could be very stoic and sort of withholding and and very elegant in many ways. Um, And this woman was very like kind of woo woo, like hippy dippy, like woman. She had like really long hair and like this German shepherd that she was obsessed with. And she kind of like dyed her hair in these like brown and gray streaks to look kind of I don't know if it was intentional but it looked a lot like German shepherd hair (laughs) and um she also had her eyebrows tattooed but one of them it was like done kind of poorly so one of them was like constantly (laughs) like quirked a little bit Um, and she was yeah she was she was like kind of like amazing I like couldn't stand her but I was like you know the two of them were pretty funny and they got into like the weirdest petty fight about like our dogs like our dogs escaped her backyard or something and got one of one of them got hurt and and she kind of blamed my mom for it and my mom was just like that bitch is out like that she crossed me like they were friends for like 20 years or something and then she they got into this weird petty fight and my mom was just like out of my life never talking Whoa. to you again and my mother actually told me like on her deathbed like don't let youngson come to the funeral and she called me And this woman was like, she saw my mom's obituary and was like, you know, I can't believe it. Is it true, Michelle? And I was like, you know, yeah, you know, we're having just like a really small funeral. Like, can you please not come? And then later on, I found out that from my aunt that my grandmother also had this friend and they had also had this petty kind of argument. And my grandmother had done the same exact thing to this friend and told her sister, like, make sure that this woman doesn't come to my funeral and so I thought that that was like such a funny um like just generational thing of like mothers and daughters and and their sort of stubborn ways but I couldn't quite um like through just I just couldn't quite thread it into the narrative uh in a way and I kept trying it was just being too stubborn and I was like it's just not worth it and so that ended up being cut and I remember uh wishing that I had figured out a way to put it in but it just didn't work out it's really interesting to hear about. Do you feel that capability in you to just be like, you're out? Like, you don't get yeah. any piece of me in your life anymore? I'm like, yeah. absolutely like that. It's, <laughs> it's like kind of scary. But it makes me I, feel I, a little bit better because I know that it's like, it's a, it's a little bit dangerous now that like my mom is gone because like in the way that most people when they grow up and they're like, oh my God, I'm becoming just like my mother and like the negative traits that they have. 
for me, and those things are like really endearing to me now because my mom's not here. So even if I do something that I maybe like hated that she did growing up, I'm like, oh, but it's like my mom. I'm like my mom, you know, even yeah. if I'm like being, being a terror. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really sweet. <laughs> I really liked, um, and correct me if I'm wrong when I'm saying this, but like, it seems like your whole family has this understanding of symbolism or even if not understanding there's so many moments in the in the book and like objects that were imbued with so much meaning mm. and uh like the jewelry like that mm. felt like so significant and like the event of a wedding or taking a trip all together with this sense of finality like um food in and of itself though it's functional there's also the symbol of like you know identity and like caretaking and like is the book now itself its own symbol yeah totally in a way I mean like I I think like towards the end especially I become sort of obsessed with this this um this archive like I think that for me um you know I honestly you know some a lot of people have asked me if I have like a great memory and I I really don't uh but I and I think that's part of the reason why I felt this real need to write this or why I have like such a desire to do what I do in general is like uh to to archive what has happened and I think that I was um so much of food for me um became you know this this way to quell like a threat this like imposing threat of like it, does this culture belong to me if my mom's not here anymore or does my mom's family even belong to me or does this country belong to me anymore if, if my mom's not here um and so I think that me learning how to make this type of food was like my way of sort of preserving that and and you know creating this ritual for myself to practice and and upkeep and also so much of writing this book I think was also just like you know, like my mom was not an artist. And I think that as an artist, I felt this like real, like it was my duty to express her in a way, like express her character and preserve her character and um, our relationship. And and also just like, I guess, prove my, my love to her. You know, I think especially, you know, the two of us had somewhat of a tumultuous relationship in my adolescence that I felt a lot of guilt for for many years. And I think in writing this book in a lot of ways, I... I was able to forgive myself for that and um you know just like showcase uh showcase that you know you can have that type of relationship with a parent and and still have a love that's really deep and I think that that's actually probably more common than than people would think is uh, people with relationships like that with their parents yeah I appreciate you like representing that so well I'll be honest like the thing I've been worried about is that I'll cry <laughs> on this because I truly you have such a deep relationship with your mom. Mess. Well, yeah, I do. And it's complicated. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah. it's weird, but uh, like different, of course, different, everyone's different. But even though, you know, it's your lived experience, I'm sure tons of people are saying this, but like, I just cried and cried and cried like so much yeah, reading your book. Yeah. It was annoying. I was like, damn, I'm crying <laughs> again. Like, stop it. Um, and so I have some questions that I'm like steering away from, even though like, I would just love to hear you talk about your mom more, but I'll fucking cry. But um, what does the book mean to your family? How, like, has your dad read it? Like, is there a Korean translation or is there going to be? Um, yeah, what has it been like to offer this to your family? Yeah, I mean, I don't have uh, too much of a relationship with my family anymore, to be honest. I mean, my, my dad and I don't speak to each other anymore. And my aunt does not speak or read English very well. So there is going to be a Korean translation. Um, I think it takes about a year. So it'll probably come out next year. And I'm very anxious and also really excited for her to read it because, like, I'm not sure... You know, like there's so much that gets lost in translation between us. We've had like, you know, and I go into it in the book of just like our relationship really deepened after my mom's passing. And I felt like, you know, in some ways uh, she was what I 
my, our relationship is what so, maybe like somewhat of what I got out of you know my mom, mom's passing was that like we we bonded together in this way and and our relationship has become really precious to me I don't know what she'll think of the book because you know we grew up in such different cultures and I do worry that like you know, a lot of East Asian cultures are very, or Korean culture is really, really private, and you don't really share, like, your family mem- matters, but, so I'm not sure um, what she'll think. Actually, I do have a cousin, my cousin on my dad's side read it, and she, she really liked it, and she was actually, like, um, really moved by it, and surprised by some parts, especially the parts that relate to our family, because my father was very, very open about his childhood and particularly about the sort of abuse that he endured. And her father completely repressed that memory and was not, um, was, would never shared that with her. So it came to her as like a little bit of a shock when, when I brought that up in, in the book and, and she was very interested in it. And she said that the, that the two of them had a, a phone conversation where he like, you know, became very, very emotional and, you know, was like, an intense conversation between them but um mm-hmm. yeah I mean it's uncomfortable like you know I think that that's just uh I think I just didn't think much about it you know I think mm-hmm. that like that's part of who I feel like I am as an artist is just like I it kind of goes to one of the lines in the book that I really love is you know while I struggled to be good I excelled at being courageous I think in, in some ways I can take that into my art and sort of how I you know my, my strengths I feel like as an artist in some ways is is the, the depths that I'm willing to, to push it, that get somewhat uncomfortable at times. Yeah. I had a, a friend one time tell me, which like, I don't, I'll just say it and assume this is a safe space, but like artists should, or like writers should write like they're an orphan, mm. like as if their family's not going to read it. Yeah. And it's yeah, not yeah. Um, like not something I've even been able to do. So I was yeah. like, really amazed by your willingness to represent both of your parents and even like knowing that your relationship with your dad um isn't good I felt like you had a really measured encompassing representation of him like I thought you were really generous in the book Mm. um it took a while to get there I will say yeah (laughs) Um, yeah. that means a lot to me it was definitely something that was really hard and took many revisions to find uh the the right way to represent him because I think that with any person and and even Kay is like that too where um you know I don't think it's interesting or realistic to present people like um you know, it, it, you have to present them as multidimensional people. And that included myself. It was really, it's really hard to like serve yourself up and, and, you know, find and admit like the things that you failed at or like things that were negative um, that you did. Uh, and it's, it's also equally hard. I would think to like, I, I would say to, um, you know, some, to, to portray some of the people that you resent and like try to see things from their side. But I also think that that's, what's really interesting about writing in general is that it offers you the ability to kind of dive into to other people's perspective and like have a deeper understanding of something that um, you might not have understood before or like, you know, have to face like, why, why did this person do this thing to hurt you? And, and most of the time I think that it, it's not malicious. It just comes from a very complicated place that from something that shaped them and who they are. Like uh, one thing, you know, I really, before writing this book, I, you know, the woman that came, there was a Korean woman who came to live with us in K who is in, in the middle of the book. And, you know, I was so angry at her for many years for kind of, you know, taking up this space, but I was also really grateful for her because she was a great help during this very difficult time. And I don't think that it was her, mali- I don't think she was maliciously like trying to push us out or be, you know, narcissistic in any way. But I do think that caretaking can, Um, bring up very strange possessive emotions in people and I think ultimately she was there to help and it it just like became intense you know she just became sort of like possessed and uh, you know so much of this book was like trying to fairly show like all all of the sides of that and you know maybe sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't but that was definitely my intention to try to like explore like people as as full human beings even if uh, they upset me during that time. Yeah, I really liked reading about her too because she like perfectly encapsulates this trait that I've had a hard time expressing, which is somebody who jumps at the chance to be Mm -hmm. a caretaker Mm -hmm. as a way to incur a debt. You know, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. someone who's like, you can't really be mad at them because they're being nice. You can't really be like they're, or they could even be essential. But, you know, some people have 
for whatever reason, and I think sometimes it's just low self-worth, they jump into those positions because they're like, if I don't have innate worth, I'll do something that makes me worthy and people will have to need me and totally want me around. So yeah, I thought that was a, a complex relation, another complex relationship you did really well. Thank you. Them. Yeah, no, that's a really great reading of it for sure. That's That's a really great way to put it. Cool. I was going to ask, like, I mean, the book basically just came out. So when did it come out? Like, how many days has it been? 420, baby. It's been out for four five. <laughs> it's, it's been out for <laughs> six, six days. It's funny because my, yeah. my my publisher was like, like, my agent was like, what if we pitch to the publisher that it come, the book comes out on Mother's Day? And I was like, oh, my God, that's so beautiful. Like, it's like Mm -hmm. reclaiming this day that's really hard for me. And like, you know, it's a gift to mothers and daughters. And then we like pitch it to the publisher and they're like, we were thinking about 420. And I was like, (laughs) (laughs) I was like, or 420, that's fine. And then in my head, I'm like, every single person I know is going to be like, oh, your book is coming out on 420, blaze it. Like, (laughs) Uh blaze it. Uh, but yeah, it's good. I, 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 it's been, uh, it's been six days out, out in the world and, and the response has been, has been pretty wild. Well, yeah, I wanted to ask you, like, this is such a heavy book. Um, and even, even with your music, I'm sure that there are people that have done this to you for a long time. So you're, you're familiar mm. with what I'm going to say, but like, have the reactions been so heavy? Like have, have people tried to match the heaviness of the book with their reactions? Cause I, I noticed that like when you really affect somebody and I think your book is very affecting, it's just like a human desire to try and give back, you know, like has anyone, should anyone keep anything in mind in terms of like what behavior is actually something you appreciate and something that is a little too far? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's totally fair. I feel like I've been pretty lucky um, in the sense that, like, I've not, I've not felt, um, like, I know that we have a, like, I know that we have a lot of peers that have had this experience where, like, it's, it's, there, there have been lines that have been crossed. And I will say, I don't know why, and maybe it's just, maybe it's bound to happen. And I've just been lucky in this way, but I haven't really felt that way. Um, uh, yet, I, I hope that it doesn't happen. But I, I, I don't know I, what I think that there are certain musicians or certain artists where like they like they I don't unintentionally like in, encourage it with their work or there's something particular about the work that inspires this behavior that I've been pretty lucky to not have felt like anyone's crossed a boundary in that way. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's because like I'm so boring in the sense that I like offer I'm like such an open book there's like just no mystery to me that no one's like wanting to know more about me because like I've already like put it out there um but yeah I haven't had that experience yet and and I hope that it never happens um uh where someone has crossed a a major boundary if, if anything honestly like this book even in, I like can't believe so many people have read the book already in six days. There have been a lot of people who are like, I've cried. I read it in one sitting. It's moved me so much. And they've shared. Um, one thing I, I you know, I, I haven't gotten any messages that have made me uncomfortable, but I've gotten a lot of messages that have made me just so happy. And, and um, you know, that's not true. OK, so to, <laughs> I, for the most part of the book, um, I have been really, really really blessed with the the response to the book and the number of people who have reached out to me like talking about their lives as caretakers or I got a really beautiful message from a woman who had survived cancer and, and told me you know in some ways like she really feels for her partner who had to to live as a caretaker and and you know how complicated that role is and I've just gotten so much feedback that's like really in-depth and, and really personal and I feel like it's so it's so much um in, it's so much more intense in a way than than people who've connected to, to music because I think in a way like there's there's like an impressionistic quality to music or like so much is up to interpretation whereas in a book it's like it's all out there and you have to really guide um the reader in in, in this way um that they feel like they have a better understanding of you maybe th- than than they do in music um but yeah I will say that like I there was a woman who wrote I don't even know if I should bring this up because it's really petty and I got in trouble for it. But um, there was a woman who wrote a think piece 
a, a, not even a woman, it was a teenager who, who wrote a think piece about the essay that I wrote in Harper's Bazaar about my dad. Uh, and she very much had like projected her relationship to her dad moving on after her mother's passing on to mine. And, you know, sort of didn't look at the, you know, I don't think she read the book or like knew the, the full story behind it, but assumed a lot of things about that relationship. And that made me very uncomfortable and, and felt very mm. in, invasive and frustrating. Um, but beyond yeah. that, every, everything's been pretty, pretty chill. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, um, I, and here I'm veering into watery territory, but I have a, a oh, really yeah. close friend that just lost her mother and she was really bothered by even other people like posting photos of her and like expressing their uh, grief. Cause she was yeah. like, you don't know, it's, like that, like yeah. that grief is mine, you know, like that's right, right. how dare you, you know, be look sadder than me or like be, I'm supposed to be sad type of thing, which I think is a totally fair reaction. Um, mm. Has any part of like giving this book to the world felt like painful or do you, is it more of a celebration? Like, and it doesn't need to be a binary, but like, I really feel like it's, it's a total gift, but I could see it being complicated. Yeah. Do you get what yeah, I'm asking? Totally. Um, I feel like honestly, it's felt like a real celebration. Like, and I didn't, um, and it, it might be in part, like I, I got, a, I got a lot of those feelings of conflict of, um, you know, sort of out of the way with my first two records because I, I, I had gotten so used to talking about um, losing my mother and especially right after it happened. When we came out with Psychopomp, like, you know, I remember I didn't tell like our publicists, like the story behind the record. I didn't tell anyone about it. And, you know, it wasn't in the press release. Like this is a record about her, her mother passing away, even though my mom's photos on, on the cover and all that. But, you know, I'm a very open person. And so when someone asks me, like, what is the song about? It's like, oh, it's about my dog pacing around my mom's room because she doesn't know where she is, you know, and, and my mom dying. And that narrative sort of cycled out. And I was talking about it all the time. And so I got really used to it pretty early on um, that the story is not mine almost. And there is a there is a, like a scary part of that, certainly. But there's also like so much honest, real grief that I feel all the time that like reminds me that, you know, it's, it's always going to be mine, you know, in a way that it's mm -hmm. like, I feel this like celebration and, and there, there is a part of me that like feels this like fear that, you know, sharing it so much with people makes it less mine. But then you have these really real moments where like nothing can take away like that feeling, you know, and it's always like with you. So, so then it reminds me that it's, it is, it is mine, no matter how much of it I, yeah. I share with the world, you know, for sure. Did you ever read that book, Motherhood by Sheila Hetty? I did not. I super recommend that book. But basically, like, she, I think, is turning 40 in the book and doesn't have a kid. She's written many books. And she's like, oh, I actually need to decide whether or not I want, like, a biological kid, like, yeah. yesterday. I, I needed <laughs> yeah. to, like, so her whole book is trying to figure out what this impulse is and if she's actually going to miss out on something. And she's like, if, since I'm a creative person mm -hmm. and I make books, have I fulfilled what I need to fulfill at, like of a creative impulse? Like, since I have books, do I have to have babies or did I do it? Did I fill the slot of like productivity and contributing to humanity? Yeah. It's a yeah. really good book. And um, that sounds very much my sh my shit. <laughs> yeah, I would just had wondered, you know, you're you're thinking about your mother so much. Like, do you think about being a mother? Or, like, I feel like that can be a changing thought. But yeah, what are your current thoughts about being a mom? Yeah, I I do want to be a mom. I think part of it is like getting married and and knowing that you know my you know my partner and I both want to have a kid and. Um, it wasn't really something I, I think I thought much about until, and I think part of it came from getting married, but it was also once my mom died, you know, and, and you're motherless, it becomes like, it, I think it's like a very natural feel. It was a very natural feeling for me all of a sudden to be like, oh, I, that part of my life is over and I can only ever like be a mom, you know? And I mm -hmm. think also like, especially writing this book, it makes me appreciate motherhood so much and and you know desire ha that for myself and uh it's been tough this year you know because like there was a part of me that was like okay I'm gonna like put on another record and go on tour for the next two or three years and try to pop one out 
And now the pandemic has like pushed that out. And I'm like, you know, in my, in my thirties and the clock is ticking, but um, yeah, that is something that I've, I've thought about and, and, and hope to do in the next like few years, but that's gotta, so cool. Gotta, gotta play the rock shows. For, I can't I wait to get like, I can't wait to get like, you know, five pairs of those like giant baby cans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get different colors to coordinate yeah. <laughs> like with outfits. Those are the coolest parents, the ones that bring their kid to the gig. Like, yeah. like that kid grows up and is cool. Yeah. Um, but it's so cool to hear you say that because so many people I know are just like, no kids for me. Yeah. Like people are disillusioned with the human experience. Just like, do I don't want to make somebody do this. Do you think um, you'll have a kid? But- well, I have always said no. I'm still yeah. loosely on no, but I think if I ever had a kid, I would have to adopt them since I'm adopted. My mom's adopted. It's just the model that I know. Wow. Yeah. Um, so it's not really a time sensitive <laughs> thing, right. though. I guess like when you're younger, you may have more energy for such a thing. But yeah. um, I've also never been I've never been able to afford having a kid and I tend to not want things that I can't have (laughs) so it's like do I really not want a kid or could I simply not take care of a kid right right who knows um but yeah I I feel like we might be going to Q&A soon but I just wanted to see if there's any burning questions oh I did want to ask writing this book obviously there's a lot you had to cut out did it open you up to the idea of writing more books and like do you also get the sense that writing a memoir at a really young age do you think you'll want to write more memoir memoirs in order to update people or like um qualify like I feel like that's something that's holding me back is like if I start this story of my life I'm probably gonna disagree or like have more insights every five years um so yeah, do you feel like there are next books kind of brewing? Yeah, definitely. I feel like so much of just the learning, like I learned so much about writing uh, in the process of writing this book that make me so excited to apply those sort of lessons to another one. In the same way that like when I wrote my first, you know, after writing a record, you just like leave that experience being like, oh, I understand so much more about like production or composition in this way. And uh, I, I can't wait to apply that for the next one. Um, so I am really excited to do that. I'm not sure what exactly it will be about. Part of me would love to take a stab at, at fiction, but it feels like, you know, it almost feels like I've I've made such a career off of like my life in a way that I, I don't even know if, if that is like available to me and almost. Um, mm-hmm. And I would love, for me, the book really leaves off in this natural place where um, I I would love to live in Seoul for a year and and document my process of learning the language and finally committing myself to becoming fluent and study a little bit about linguistics and and the brain and and age and and learning um and and I think part of my desire to do that is because it, I will never become fluent in Korean I feel like if I don't make a project out of it and also I um you know, after writing a memoir, I I found myself desiring writing something in in the present tense, you know, something that was happening in real time and keeping a sort of journal and and realizing how much easier that would have been. And that's probably the next book that I am interested in in writing. Yeah. Does that mean you're journaling now? I'm not. I'm like one of those people that like always is like, you need to keep a journal this year. I've had that been, that's been like my new year's resolution for like the past five years. And I, and I can't keep it up. I'm, I'm terrible at it. What I'll say about journaling is since I've, I've journaled since I was seven and I, in quarantine, finally went back and started at the beginning and was reading through and I'm shocked wow. at Where's how. Where's the memoir? Where's the memoir? <laughs> um, I am not bold enough. I'm not brave like you, Michelle. Yes, you are. Um, I just, I need, I need a little time, I think, but I, I got to. I have 13 journals and I got to number four around like a hundred thousand words. And I was like, I'm going to stop typing this up. (laughs) But the, the thing that's shocking, what what I'll say about like this impulse to journal and maybe you'd be different than me, but I would write in the moment what I thought was going on. And then I'm going, I'm about to read something that I remember so vividly. And I just didn't write about it, how it happened. Mm -hmm. Like I, I just like wrote, I was like making my, my own narrative, you know, you like when I was a vividly, kid. You vividly remember something and you, you can see that you're lying, like in the, that I'm lying or, like or I'm creating, omitting yeah, it. Like there's, in some way. 
so like don't worry I, I feel like you if you have the power of perception like if you can recall like journaling is interesting but I don't even think it's essential in terms of like record keeping because uh I think perspective is more valuable than facts mm -hmm. um but anyways um let me there's a bunch of questions now so I want to give people time to the have chat that. the chat says hashtag release the Dacus memoir <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, I see someone saying something about Sarah Mangusa's work. Did you ever read any of her work, Michelle? No. Um, Ongoingness. It's another book about journaling. It's really short. I think you'd probably really like it. Amazing. I'll um, pick up those two books. Yeah. <laughs> I always feel like I'm giving people a sign. It's not an assignment. You don't have to give a book report, <laughs> No, I love but, that um, about you. <laughs> so, that's, um, that's nice. I think some people <laughs> get stressed out. <laughs> by me being like you love I love this I love homework yeah cool <laughs> um Truly. well then hit me up when you read them but I'm just gonna I go will. from the top and see if Great. we've covered anything um halfway through the book love it and wondering if it turned out differently than you first imagined it being you kind of talked about how you edited a bunch but is there anything more you want to say about that um yeah I think that it turned out so differently than I I thought it would um I don't know like what I really expected from it but it did um I think I discovered quite a bit about myself and, and my mother's character and, and writing in and I think part of the part of the writing process in general both in in book writing and, and music writing is, is sort of allowing for that to happen mm -hmm. that was from Matthew so Trinity says, hi, Michelle, haven't yet been able to get my hands on your book, but as soon as I do, what is the one most important thing that you want me and other readers to keep in mind while reading? Sending lots of love, XX. Sweet I, question. That is a sweet question. Um, I feel like, um, you know, I would love for people to, you know, I saw someone say like, this book made me like want, you know, I had just gotten into a fight with my mom and, and it made me call her and like give her a hug and, you know, recognize that even though our relationship is like tumultuous and complicated that like I really love her and that this is like an important, you know, relationship. Uh, I love to hear that. Um, I will say that like, I'm not sure that people know, like I think that the book can be somewhat graphic and, and, and a little bit like horrifying and intense at times. And I don't know if people, I don't know how many people anticipate that going into like a, a book that's like been largely, you know, um, like it's a, it's a food memoir and it's, it's a, it's a memoir by a musician. But I think that, you know, I, I think people might be surprised to, to discover that there are, there are some pretty intense um, like it, scenes in the book. And, and I would, I would warn against those. Like, I, I feel like if, if you're, if you're coping with like illness or, uh, stuff like that is triggering to you then then it is it, it's a tough book and, and and to definitely proceed with caution and there's also some like calorie counting stuff like that that if you had like um some some like a bad relationship with food it, it's maybe a little bit difficult uh, and triggering in that way so I would, yeah. I would I would put those warnings out there as well I think that's totally fair um how different was writing this book versus writing your own music was there any overlap in writing this book with any of your albums asks Priscilla yeah, um, there's actually, you know, the Japanese breakfast heads will will recognize that there's a ton of uh, borrowed lyrics and and a lot of the the chapter titles um, borrow from different song lyrics or like there will be a line in the book uh, that is a, a line from a different song or, you know, it, it it's all drawing from the same pool of memory in a way. And so uh, there's there are definitely um, things that are in conversation with one another. Cool. Um Michelle, what books did you read while you were writing Crying in H, crying in H Mart? Crying Holy in shit. H Mart. <laughs> crying. That's my Virginia When you're crying out. in H Mart. Oh. Um, Jane says, love you so much. So yeah, what oh. were you reading? Oh, um, I was reading all sorts of stuff. You know, I feel like I was reading a lot of musicians' memoirs, a lot of food memoir, a lot of grief memoir. Um, I really liked Between Them by Richard Ford. I liked MFK Fisher's Gastronomical Me, Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion. Um, Please Look After Mom by, I always forget her name. I re, oh, her name is Kyung Suk Shin. Uh, I reread Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson, who we love. Um, you know, for maybe like the hundredth time. Um, yeah. One thing I really loved about, uh, one, I, I've said this before, but 
one note that my editor gave me was like, I wish that you mentioned you talked more about the weather. And I was like, what? You know, <laughs> like, what are you talking <laughs> about? And, um, and I went through and I, I reread uh, Richard Ford's Rock Springs and, and Marilyn Robinson's housekeeping. And I underlined all of the sentences about the weather and mm -hmm. figured out how they worked and what they brought to the table. And then I went back through the book in the revision process and just found scenes that were missing and needed a little bit of color. And then just like thought about like what the sky looked like at that point in time and started inserting these lines about the weather and what it was like to kind of put the reader, uh, you know, deeper into the, the, the changing of time and also just like the space and in the environment. And I feel like it's a much better book because of, because of that one note. And it was such an interesting assignment to go back in and read these books that you really love and only focus on, on one very small element of it and, and what it's, how it's functioning. Yeah, I, I read Rock Springs because you recommended it and I was just trying to remember what stuff from that. And I feel like he's so terse and like, yeah, no word is spared. Like, right, right. And I feel like the, the weather is almost like him passively trying to tell you the mood or something totally, or to just totally, highlight totally, something totally. dissonant. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. I saw a question um, from Jose. Hi, Michelle and Lucy. Was very taken with your tweets comparing Mourinho to Stannis. The people and I must know which football clubs do you two support? <laughs> I'm a poser. I have to say I'm a poser. My husband really loves um, football, uh, uh -huh. as the locals would call it. Um, I just, I watched the, the Jose Mourinho documentary. So I just like Tottenham uh, Hotspur because, mostly because of Hyung Min San. Uh, the, the Korean player. Uh, and I do like everyone hates Jose Mourinho, but I have like kind of a soft spot for him in the same way that I have a soft spot for Stannis because I think I just like stoic, like kind of try hard men, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, yeah. Like, I'm the same way. Want so badly to win, but like, yeah. Are, it's not working for some reason. Or like, you know, <laughs> he's got this like big responsibility. And like, yeah. 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 I feel the and same it's way. His weight. Yeah. Yeah. I, he did, he was the um, coach for Man United for a while, I think. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I was following him when he was doing that. I don't have a team. But yeah. I love Virgil van Dyke so much that I might as well say Liverpool, but I don't want to make enemies. <laughs> um, I really, I, I love Man United also. I also like really followed one season and have since gotten busy and not been able to watch games. Um, That's amazing. But yeah, it's amazing. It, it's so much fun. It's just gossip. You know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. even all the Mourinho, Mar is it Mourinho or? Yeah, I think it's Mourinho. Mourinho. Um, right? Yeah, just like all of this, all the news about him is just so, it's so gossipy. I love it. Um, okay, I, know. So. I know he was fired. I feel bad for him. I'm looking at the chat and they're like, he was fired last week. And oh, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's how I think. This came up, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, In cool. the same way that Stannis like loses the war, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the range of this life. <laughs> I know. Uh, okay, let's see. From Jasmine. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for writing such a beautiful piece of work. I've seen Jay Brecky three times and was fortunate enough wow. to meet you a couple of years ago at your signing at end of an year. I also lost my mom in 2014. I was 15 at the time. My question for mm. you is, were there any specific artists or music that helped you at the initial oh grieving God. stage? I found listening to music during that time helped a ton. Um, gosh, you know, like, I can't remember like the timing very well of what I was listening to. But I will say, Carrie and Lowell, like Supion Stevens, Carrie and Lowell wrecked the shit out of me. And, you know, especially because so much of that album like kind of takes place in Oregon, which is where I was, um, was really, really intense. And, and I don't even know if it helped me, but it certainly I certainly listened to it a lot. And another record was um, Mount Erie's A Crow Looked At Me which is just like the most devastating album. And he's just like always been a real hero of mine and someone like who I think uh, values um, oversharing uh, your, you know, personal life and to the point that it's almost uncomfortable in this way that I've, I've become uh, interested in. But um, yeah, you know, that record is about his wife passing away. And I, I, you know, like there's just so many devastating lines that made me feel so not like so much less alone but it was also just I could never listen to that album again I have like a photo of me just like 
completely wrecked uh, in the car having to pull over uh, after listening to the song. Yeah. And the one line, I mean, there's one line that always stuck with me, which was, you know, they talked about like how um, him and his wife used to like round. I don't know if this was like in an interview or if it was in the actual lyric, but, you know, they talk about rounding, um, like walking the block to their therapist's office and how like, you know, at, over the course of her treatment, she got slower and slower. And that was very much something that happened to my mom and I, we would do these walks around the house and eventually we could no longer do them. And, you know, uh, that sort of physical, like, you know, symbol of, of deterioration in a way. And then there's another just devastating line that I think is maybe the, one of my favorite lines ever written was just, and I don't want to learn anything from this. And that is like something that like really haunts me in such a simple way of ex expressing uh, loss and, and, and that kind of experience. And, um, yeah, I, I, I think that's it's just the most devastating line. And, and those two records yeah. were definitely huge for me, I think. Yeah, <laughs> this is, a, I guess, a similar question, but turned on you from Nicole Ann Keaton. Hi, who I went to school with, actually. Oh, from wow. Michelle, do you have a favorite line you wrote that keeps coming back to you, like when you're washing dishes or running errands? Also, hi, Lucy. Hi, Nicole Ann. Oh, that's so cute. Um, uh, oh, uh, one of the lines on the new record that I really love um, that hasn't come out yet. I, I think it's maybe one of the sweeter songs that I've written. It's from the perspective of a of a young boy uh, who lives in, in rural Indiana and it's called Kokomo, Indiana. And uh, it's about like him saying goodbye to his girlfriend who's like going off to a foreign exchange program in Australia. And um, the line is like, God, I felt so much back then. I was soft as a dune, which I was like, it's like the weirdest line. Uh, but I, I just, I love this like soft hearted teenage boy, like proclaiming like his, 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 being as soft as a dune. <laughs> I love, I just imagine like a giant hand on a giant dune, dune yeah. just like squashing that it down. So <laughs> That's so awesome. What a good image. Um, I'm skipping around a, a little bit because I think some people have asked things that we have talked about, but um, Great. from uh, Jane, this might be random, but what are some of your favorite snacks that helped you get by during your writing process? Seems oh relevant. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, I am such a major snacker. I'm trying to think of what I ate a lot. I mean, there was times I was in Korea. I had like a six week retreat. What were we eating? Oh my God. What was I eating during this time? I, 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 I wrote a big hunk of the, the initial stages of the book in 2017 uh, or 2018. It was like January of 2018. I was in Seoul for six weeks uh, writing the very beginnings of this book. And it was so, so cold. And, and like, I, it's just, I, I never really, I, I grew up going to Korea every other summer and I only knew Korea as like a summer place. And my mom would always be like, it gets really cold in the winter time. And I'd be like, Oh, you're just like being a mom over exaggerating about things. And, and then when I actually got to live there, like during the winter time, I was like, it was unbelievably cold. And like my husband and I were just yeah. in this like tiny, like studio apartment, just going insane. And, um, I was probably eating a lot of, um, giant like dumplings at the time like the kind of like ones that are sort of cake like uh and we were eating a lot of black bean noodles we were eating a lot of like oh I ate a lot of corn dogs there I had a lot of like street corn dogs and mm -hmm. uh, I was I was big on the corn dogs uh at, at that time yeah that rocks <laughs> Um, I feel like this is maybe a question that you could be as brief or, uh, as you want to be, but Harper asked, how do you think your mom would respond to this book being written and published? Um, I think that she, I, you know, I, I think she would be weirded out. Um, honestly, <laughs> like she probably would be like, not super stoked about, uh, some of it. And, and, um, but I, I like to think, uh, you know, some, uh, to answer another question that we had before in a different way, um, what what do you hope like people get out of this um my ideal sort of reader is actually like someone like my mom finding out about this book reading this book and saying to their daughter in this kind of like like chiding way like oh, i hope you love me this much to write something like this for for me when i die like i can <laughs> like i can see my mom like i can see my mom reading something like this and um <laughs> <laughs> sorry I can, <laughs> I can see my like... mom 
re- like finding out about a book about like a Korean daughter like writing writing this for her mom and and say and chiding me in this way of just like I hope you love me that much when I die. Uh, and so I feel like in a way like that's like sort of what I I hope to to get out of it and and what I what I wish that even if my mom might have been like curmudgeonly about like why did you have to sh- share that that's private um <laughs> Uh, I think that she ultimately would feel that way. That this this reads like a, a daughter who truly loves her mom. That is such a good answer and like so true. <laughs> I'm sure that that is happening or will be happening. Um, Megan says, "Hi Michelle, I loved your book, Smiley Face. You mentioned how it felt selfish to think of yourself and the musical potential of tragedy of your mother's passing. How did you overcome overcome this to write Psycho Pump?" Um, I think for me, I. I had, I had always felt like, you know, this is who I am and this is the most important thing in my life. And there was a moment where I tried to make a creative project out of my mom's illness while she was still alive. And I was trying to document it in this way. And, you know, my hope, I think, honestly, was like, she's going to get better, you know? And I was like, right. I wanted, at one point I wanted to, you know, make this documentary. I wanted to write it. Uh, about this experience where we overcame this disease and I think over time it was becoming clear and clear that you know that wasn't going to be our narrative you know and I had to kind of be like you know what are you doing you have to just you know caretaking is such a full-time job that it was like you have to you can't do anything else you have to just be here 100 percent and um you know that was like a hard thing to recognize uh and, and not something that I recognized until sort of later on um, and so I, I did not make any, any art when, when she was sick. And then, you know, I think I had like a couple of months where I was just, you know, it was difficult to move. And, um, eventually it just, it became something like a private thing for myself, you know, and I had no real, um, I had no real ambition for what it was going to do. I, I was just at the time I lived, <clears throat> you know, after my mom passed away, I was, I stayed in Eugene for six months, sort of like helping my dad pack up the house and, and do all the things that you have to do after someone passes away. Um, and to sort of like give myself, you know, reprieve from, from that experience, I, I would go down to this little shed at the bottom of my parents' property and, and write some songs about, you know, just mostly to just be like, what the fuck just happened? You know, <laughs> like yeah. I just, it was so much of just like, I need to like get down what happened because that was a real whirlwind and I don't feel like I can even begin to express to people what have, what has just happened. And I need to like, I need to take the space to like, just write out what I, what, what happened, you know? And then, Mm -hmm. so I had no real like goals for that record and it was just a private sort of meditation on what had happened and and a a project to anchor me during this really hard time as a sort of selfish thing for myself, I guess, which is not selfish, but, um, in this experience, but like, uh, yeah, it was really just like something to do outside of, uh, cleaning, cleaning the house for, for many months. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, there's a question that has to do with the plot of the book. I don't think it's a spoiler, but Kathleen asked, do you have any ideas what your mom said to Kay before she left? Oh yeah. That's a really good question. I have no idea. Um, that was one thing that I, I, I included like a paragraph about like some some speculation of, of what I thought that she might have said. Um, but um, my editor was like, it's better to just leave it, you know, um, mm-hmm. and, and let the reader sort of fill that in. I have no idea what she said. Um, my, you know, there was like some speculation that she was like, who are you or something or like that she was like, it's time to leave now or like you can go or, or whatever. But I, I really don't know. Um, and I'll, I'll mm-hmm. never know. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That was, I think, a very I agree with your editor. I think that was a cool mm, way yeah. to, to yeah. do that. Um, Renee asks, this may seem like a silly question, but years of marketing has broken my brain. Has anyone from H Mart contacted you about the book? <laughs> Um, we have been in touch with H Mart. Um, I hope to do like some kind, they're aware of its existence. I wrote like a very um, personal letter to the CEO of H Mart, just like thanking him for like uh, the space or thanking them. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I hope to do something with them in the future. I think it's like, obviously it's like complicated right now. I think it's complicated with like, um, where you can sell books like initially. So like, it might be something that we have to do with the paperback or um, yeah, I would love to do like a reading at H Mart at some point in time. I think especially like after, you know, we are all vaccinated and, and things start, you know, hopefully 
turning a corner here in the next few months uh knocking on yeah Uh, (laughs) yeah, like uh hopefully hopefully we can do something with them in the future because i would i would love i would love 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 to that'd be so cool event there yeah love that it's like the the punk shows at the waffle house but (laughs) indie rock at the h mart (laughs) (laughs) um There's a question from Olivia and she says, Michelle, have you ever felt the weight and pressure of being someone to look up to as a woman of color, especially in the arts? And when you were growing up, did you feel any pressure to steal your life in a direction that would quote, honor your different cultural heritage as compared to your white peers from a fellow half Korean woman creative? Yeah, you know, I think that this is a really new thing for me um, in the last like few years where I, I find that I, I think especially like after the Atlanta shooting and and feeling like this major pressure as an Asian American voice um, to like, you know, I was getting asked a lot about like, what do you think about these like AAPI hate crimes? And, and it was really tough because I, I, you know, like I'm in, it, it just because you're an artist and of a certain identity does not mean that you're like a political activist or great at these types of things. And I would love to be that. Um, and I, I, I would love to be this courageous voice and, and rise to the occasion. And I know that I have this platform and I have a, a major responsibility to, to use it. Um, but it, it's, it's, a, it's something that I really struggle with all the time and, and I'm still learning how to do. And, and um, you know, like, uh, yeah, uh, I, I feel like it's been, it's been really tough, like, because I, I, I don't know exactly what my role in it is in all of this. And it's, it's kind of gotten to the point where it's like, is it, is it not quite enough to, to just be, you know, a new voice in, in your industry, you have to also use it to impact change in this way. But, you know, it's just tough because like, as an artist, like any time that you don't put into your craft uh, feels like, um, detrimental in a way you know and so like even even though I have interests in 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 like the right thing happening or like being politically active like it is hard to figure out like how much time to devote to that and how how active to be in that environment because it also like it takes away from your craft and so I'm really like figuring out how to negotiate that sort of um like that that time you know and and figure out like what my role in all of that that is and it's something I definitely think about a lot yeah I it's nobody's job to represent whatever demographic they fall into I think that's a a huge responsibility to expect of everyone but I also have been like following your social media and just seeing different like Asian American writers respond to it there seems to be this really like joyous uh, celebration that is very cool from to watch from even the outside. Um, I've just been scrolling through the questions, and a couple people asked about audiobook. You did an audiobook, right? I did do the audiobook. Um, I I read the book over the course of three days, and it was a. I thought it was going to be such a grueling process, but I had the most wonderful director and engineer, and it was actually just a really therapeutic uh amazing process because it was the first time I read the book you know front to back in 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 several months and refreshed the material for me in 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 a really great way and I was able to appreciate the book so much more after reading that like after some some time had gone by and uh yeah it's available wherever audiobooks are available (laughs) that's cool Um, I only cried one time (laughs) yeah I would imagine that being like really tough (laughs) so one time is less than I think a lot of us cried reading it um I think I'm gonna only take one more question just because I've been scrolling and scrolling and there are so many so we have to just stop sometime yeah yeah um but since you thank you so much for your time yeah thanks to everybody oh yeah, no, thank you. This has been like a total pleasure. Like this is, I, I will want to take you out for dinner sometime to oh, talk we, more. I can't wait. I'm fully back yeah. now. And I'm, I'm oh, me to too. Go. Yeah. Cool. Um, but uh, I also, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm there for you when, when the Dacus memoir hits. When the Dacus <laughs> memoir drops. Please, please oh my gosh. For, uh, I'm going to be throwing tour. up. I simply don't have the courage <laughs> that you have. Uh, one day maybe I will. But You do, you know, I have, I have to say, I, I hope this isn't like, I hope this isn't taken the wrong way, but I remember I saw you perform in New York 
um, where was that? Was it Web- Webster Hall? Webster Hall, I think, yeah. Yeah, Webster Hall. And I have to say, like, first of all, you have, like, such a beautiful, like, voice that just gives me like goosebumps all over my body and like seeing you live I highly recommend everyone see Lucy live when when you get a chance like one of my favorite voices in 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 indie rock I have to say um but you know I had such a funny moment because I was like I was I looked over to my husband I was like your your stage presence is so unique you know because like I was like I was like that is like a, that is a that is a tourist running her fucking show you know <laughs> like I feel like the energy of like you know you're you're not the kind of front person that's like so in everyone's like you know like I'm such a like clown that I feel like I have to you know that the, the type of energy that I bring to my show is so different from the energy that you bring to your show and it's so unique and your fan base is like so devoted in this very unique way that I feel like it's amazing because like I feel like I'll, I'll, all of my best friends are, are Tauruses actually. And like, I feel like getting to see like a Taurus in her in her zone that she's created is like this really like unique and beautiful thing because it's like, it's like, it's like the secret power like sign. <laughs> and and um, yeah, I just like, I love to see, I just like, I, I had so much fun at your show and it was like so uh, wonderful to see you like I uh, loved, run, run a crowd, you know? Uh, well, one, thank you too. Loved seeing you. I haven't seen your band. I have tried yeah, multiple wild. times and it's been like, I've been on tour when you're in my town or our festival sets are on different yeah, days yeah. or something. Yeah, 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 but yeah. like, I mean, you're obviously a, a legendary Aries and like I envy <laughs> the being able to move around and like get people hype and like wear amazing things and like use everything at your disposal. <laughs> like I really, I mean, yeah. Real see real, as it said, or is it said? Real see real. real. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna close on this question just because it's a right, mutual right. interest. I dropped out of um, film school, and you finished film school and directed your music videos, which look so fucking good. Um, and uh, Robert asked, "Would you want to bring any parts of this book to film or TV?" And then I'm gonna make an addendum to that. Do you have any aspirations beyond this book for film or TV? Yeah, um, I don't know when this is going to be announced, but the book is is being optioned. Um, so that is something that I will be. I don't even know if I'm supposed to talk about, but I, I am going to be writing the screenplay for this book, um, and it's pretty wild. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I I think eventually someday in my life I might have the goal to. Um, uh, to to direct a, a feature of some kind but it is something that I've just like come to really really love and uh uh yeah it's become like a wonderful wonderful t- type of storytelling I also feel like it's like the most difficult medium to 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 work in that like that's part of like what makes me uh want want to take on the challenge yeah Oh my God, that's so exciting. I'm yeah, really glad yeah. that we didn't leave without you saying that. I know. I feel wow. like I'm like, yeah, we'll see. I, I probably shouldn't have like said anything, but it should. Everyone should keep it out. a secret. The news, <laughs> Everyone pretty, the, the, the news should come out pretty soon. Yeah. And we're either going to get Emma Stone or Scarlett Johansson to play me as the lead. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh God, what are, where is this going? <laughs> Holy shit. Um, Emma, Emma Stone, our biracial queen. <laughs> oh my god wow well I'm really excited for you to do that and just like stretch another part of what you're capable of um I think we're probably gonna wind down but yeah go way see over Japanese time, breakfast yeah. on tour oh yeah book people are coming back thank yeah, you Uriel. I, yes uh I just want to express nothing but gratitude uh to you both this was the most wonderful event I love that oh, we thank got- you Ariel. Yeah, I love that we got all the insights and um, I am like just waiting for that, that Japanese breakfast reading slash performance at H Mart here in Austin. Oh, yeah. yes, Great. I know yes. we're going to make it happen. Um, yes. <laughs> but th- so thank you to everyone. Everyone's in the chat. They're really excited. They love you. Thank all. you so much for coming. Yeah. And, uh, remind everyone, get the book crying at H Mart <laughs> available at book people. Now Bezos can not bring you fun like this. So support an indie <laughs> while you're at it. Uh, thank you all so much have a really wonderful night y'all bye, bye. thank you <laughs>